Hey everyone, this is Nick from the Botch Pit. Today, we're discussing Pandorans, also known as the Unborn, the Broken, the Curses, and the Mockeries. They are an extension of Flux for Promethean the Created. The sources used in this broadcast are Promethean the Created 1st and 2nd editions, as well as their source books, Pandora's Book, Strange Alchemies, Magnum Opus, Saturnine Night, as well as Night Horrors the Tormented for Promethean the Created. No punches were pulled for this broadcast. We're running every major book in the game line. Introduction Through a Glass Darkly See, you're on your pilgrimage, right? Sure, so am I. Think about that word, pilgrimage. Conjures up all sorts of old stories, doesn't it, about moving from place to place. But the devil that plagues us are something real. They let you know you're on the right path. You ever fall from that path, you ever walk away from it. Well, have you heard of the Sentimani? Freaks that don't undertake the pilgrimage anymore? Well, they collect packs of the little rotters. Train them like hounds, and those Pandorans don't try and eat them. No, sir. You see, you stop walking that path, they stop trying to eat you. Prometheans stare through a glass darkly at the unborn. These horrific creatures are the result of a failed attempt to create a Promethean. They are a painful reminder of what could have been, but now never will. What they are, however, is hunger incarnate. Many Prometheans are forced to acknowledge that if they did not exist in the world, the world would have fewer monsters in it. And if the Promethean awakes the Pandorans, the Prometheans must put the Pandorans down. These creatures feed on Pyros, and as such hunt down and kill Prometheans. If they go too long without food, they become dormant and resemble inanimate objects. The pilgrimage is a great journey, requiring the Promethean to travel far and wide to complete it and realize what it's like to truly be human. The opposite side of that coin is to lie in wait, watching, remaining dormant until it's your time to strike. They reanimate when bathed in Azothic radiance. Although Azothic memory provides some information on them, almost everything Prometheans know about Pandorans comes from the Sentimani, who are the only beings who can get close enough to study them. Quick terminology now, entire video later. A Sentimani is a Promethean with the refinement of Flux. Some Pandorans can even be considered family to Prometheans, a brother or sister lost through trials to bring their siblings into this world, and they hate them for everything they aren't able to be. Part 1 Lore Overview Pandorans are birthed from failed attempts at creating a new Promethean. The Azoth must be pure in the new body in order to infuse it with the alchemy mockery of true life that is the Promethean existence. But sometimes, the passage of Azoth from creator to created is tainted and flux poisons the divine fire. The corpse tears itself apart, and as pieces of the body hit the ground, some of them warp and twist, growing vestigial limbs. Pandorans are driven by a terrible hunger and are wicked, brutal hunters. Creatures of flux, they are driven to consume all the sources of Azoth they can find. Within Pandorans, flux manifests strangely, for it seemingly cannot exist without Azoth to balance it. Therefore, when Pandorans are outside the aura of Azothic radiance that all Prometheans emit, the power of flux within them takes hold and drives them first mad with hunger, then forcing them into dormancy should that hunger fail to find another source of Azoth. Once they've been conscious for a while, however, Pandorans exhibit a sort of low cunning. Such Pandorans are more likely to capture a Promethean, occasionally consuming it, savoring it in small pieces in order to make the source of Azoth last as long as possible. The thing that makes Pandorans different from Prometheans is the fact that Pandorans can't become human. They exist only to wait and consume. The Sublimatus can't become human because it has no Azoth of its own and cannot create a soul in the Promethean Crucible. An animal Promethean can't become human because he simply isn't made from a human body. As for Flux, extended activity by active Pandorans in an area always taints it subtly with Flux. Simply existing in an area is sufficient for Pandorans to begin tainting their surroundings with Flux. If a Pandoran meets its death in an area, the area becomes tainted by the flux released at the shattering of the Pandoran's being. Birth A creator might look upon a Pandoran and briefly see a flash of the child they set out to create, a beautiful and vibrant companion who would have eased their loneliness and pain. If they stay there, however, only pain they will find. Immediately after its conception, a new Pandoran's body is griped by roiling, churning flux causing it to sprout new limbs and deformities even as Flux rips the body apart from the inside out. The resulting creature, or creatures, as ripped off parts sometimes gain a life of their own, is smaller than the average human and horribly bent and broken. 
they do not know how the taint defines itself, nor how they can check for it, which leaves Prometheans in a terrible state of uncertainty when it comes to reproducing. The Sentimani know that a creator's Azoth can be tainted by unspent vitriol or heavy flux in the area, but they would rather keep this information to themselves. Assuming its creator doesn't kill it right then and there, the Pandoran snatches up whatever broken body parts it can and scurries away. This misshapen being is only a protoform, an embryo spewed forth before it was fully gestated. Sensing its incompleteness and still being ravaged by flux, some Pandorans seek out the nearest place where they can burrow out of sight and undergo a chrysalis, and their flesh hardens to the consistency of that of marble. During this gestation period, the Pandoran is vulnerable to anyone who can damage its chrysalis shell. Waiting for its body to set, the creature remains in the grips of flux, resulting in limbs sprouting from bellies, gnashing maws on hands, joints that bend backwards, and a myriad of other deformities. A chrysalis can last anywhere from a few hours to a few weeks. After the stony chrysalis hatches, a fully formed Pandoran emerges. Although Pandorans usually begin their existences as pieces of human physiology, they are not necessarily humanoid in shape. In truth, once Pandorans emerge from their chrysalis, they can bear nearly any form due to flux. Form A, Humanoid. Some Pandorans are humanoid in shape, if not humanoid in appearance. Most Pandorans are smaller than the average human, so they end up appearing as strange, diminutive things. Devils, elves, and even aliens. That's it, man. Game over, man. Game over. And they mostly come at night. Mostly. A few European Prometheans still tell the story of the massive horde of Pandorans inadvertently awakened by a young Promethean within a hollow hill in central Ireland. The little creatures that swarmed up out of the hill might be easily mistaken for brownies, buckon, and other good neighbors of Irish folklore. Form B. Animals other Pandorans may take shapes reminiscent of animals, at least at a quick glance. Though these quick glances don't save them from dormancy when the human mind registers the flux within them. The precise nature of the shape often depends on a variety of things, but some Sentimani maintain that the shape of an animalistic Pandoran are influenced by the humor within the mockery and the origins of the lineage that spawned the Pandoran. For example, Sebek Pandorans have been known to take the form of watery creatures in desert creatures, while some render Pandorans have been seen in shapes reminiscent of taiga and steppe animals such as antelopes and foxes. Wait, what does this all even mean? What's like half the things I'm talking about? Honestly, Promethean the created terminology can be very confusing at times, hence probably why you're here with me right now. But just accept it for the moment and we'll circle back to it later in the character creation portion of this. It will all make sense in the end. Form C. Other. Perhaps the rarest of the Pandorans are those whose shapes aren't overtly animalistic or humanoid. These strange creatures may exist as animate swarms, liquids, or even clouds of particles or gas. Seemingly intelligent and extremely predatory pools of ooze, or masses of tendrils that seem to be nothing more than a tangled mess of animate muscle fiber with a few sensory organs have all been encountered. You probably already know where I'm going with this. You see, when a man bleeds, it's just tissue. But blood from one of you, things, won't obey when it's attacked. It'll try and survive. Honestly, by the end of this broadcast, if you still have questions on what a Pandoran actually is, go look up John Carpenter's 1982 film, The Thing. It will have everything you'll need to run Pandorans in your game, trust me. Hunger. The single defining trait of all Pandorans is their terrible, insatiable hunger. A Pandoran needs Pyros to balance its internal flux, or that flux will tear it apart. A freshly awakened Pandoran is desperate for Pyros, and is only barely sentient. Even their forms of combat are driven by the need to feed. Pandorans often grapple their foes, seeking to immobilize them in order to eat their flesh. The Pandoran uses teeth and claws to rip away and consume Pandoran flesh on the spot, stuffing the meaty bits into its mouth even as it goes back for more. Pyros gained in this fashion does not subtract from the Promethean's available Pyros pool. This energy comes from the rapid ingestion of Azoth-infused flesh and blood, inflicting health wounds. As a result, a few Sentimani keep their Pandoran packs sated and happy by allowing them to consume some of the Sentimani's own flesh occasionally, repairing the damage through the use of transmutations or electricity. Pandorans cannot consume the flesh of other Pandorans to gain Pyros in this fashion, save for when they enter a flux hunger. Pandorans possess a cunning animal intelligence and are capable of hunting in packs. Any hint of Pyros rich blood whips the pack into a frenzy, and pack members turn on each other as easily as they do the created. A 
Pandora may spend hours, even days, setting up an elaborate spider's web to ensnare its prey, or painstakingly track a Promethean using the trail left by their pyros. Pandorans might smell the coppery scent of pyros, see it hanging in the air like a trail of fire, hear a faint sound of thunder in the distance, or simply feel its pull. Once an unborn is on the scent of a Promethean, nothing will stop it, whether it takes a day, a month, or a year to catch its prey. Dormancy or more easily captured prey might divert the creature's hunt for a while, but death is the only true end to the hunt. Within Prometheans is a substance of the great work. Prometheans refine their essence into a substance known as vitriol. In game terms, points of vitriol are gained as a special form of experience points. However, these points are not simply game system devices the way experience points are. The inner organs of Prometheans contain this substance, and Pandorans hunger for it. Vitriol holds a special place in a Pandoran's cold heart. Lacking a working inner refinery, the Pandora must consume Promethean vitriol to shape its body into a new, fully formed mutation. The Pandora must act quickly though, as its own distorted alchemic body warps and corrupts any stolen vitriol, making it completely unusable in less than a minute. Consumed vitriol, if spent within this short time frame, may be used to purchase new physical attribute dots or dread powers. A Pandora might also try to raise its manipulation or intelligence with vitriol, even though its own nature resists such delicate balancing. If the storyteller decides that the Pandoran, usually an exceptionally clever or reoccurring antagonist, attains dots of intelligence or manipulation in this fashion, the creature immediately becomes a sublimatus. That term's come up a little bit now. We'll touch back on it later, trust me. It can sense the scent of vitriol lying deep within a Promethean's organs and longs for this special treat above all. Instead of gaining pyros for consuming health points, Pandorans may instead snatch up vitriol-rich inner organs and consume them. The Pandoran infuses its teeth or hands with one point of pyros to coax the vitriol to the surface, then violently rips into the Promethean's body to yank out their inner organs. If it has the luxury of time, the Pandoran might savor the piece of liver, spleen, or tongue like a gourmand. You know it's getting dangerous when the Promethean terms don't trip me up, but French does. If not though, it will happily stuff it right down its throat like a cheap snack. A Pandoran is nothing if not opportunistic. One certain source of flux in the environment is Pandoran consumption and use of vitriol, the superbly transformative inner elixir of Prometheans, used to improve on the warping of a Pandoran form always creates flux as a byproduct. Even if that area has never seen any other activity from Pandorans or Prometheans, a single Pandoran consuming vitriol and bending its potential to serve the flux is sufficient to taint an area for days afterwards. In game terms, when a Pandoran consumes vitriol, the storyteller spends those points on behalf of the Pandoran exactly as though it were points of experience, purchasing new Pandoran transmutations. The amount of vitriol gained isn't always enough to quite purchase a new transmutation though. In some cases, the Pandoran gains the new transmutation or upgrades an old one, pays all the vitriol it contains, and then takes one point of lethal damage per additional experience point cost to pay for the remaining unpaid for experience points to actually purchase the transmutation. Dormancy When denied the radiance of Azoth, Pandorans fall into a hibernation. The flesh of the Pandoran hardens, ossified by flux without any Azoth to counter it, becoming as hard as marble. They are definitively inanimate things, rather than creatures. Thus, it is not normally possible for magic or any other kind of power to detect them for what they are. Though some simply petrify as they are, leaving behind statues that resemble the original Pandoran in every way, many Pandorans actually take on shapes other than their own in dormancy. Often, the choice of form is a factor of the environment. Dormancy in an art gallery or museum might appear to be a work of art, while those that enter dormancy atop an old gargoyle-encrusted edifice might simply appear to be yet another masonry monster. Pandorans in theme parks assume the likeness of cute cartoon characters, or broken merry-go-round creatures complete with saddles. Pandorans can also assume the shape of other things entirely appropriate to the mockery of the Pandoran. A dormant Pandoran is treated as an object. Its durability is equal to its stamina, and its structure is equal to its health. Pandorans enter dormancy when they are exposed to the disquiet they evoke in humans, or when their pyros pool drops to zero and remains there for one day or more. Within 24 hours of death, Pandorans return to their dormant form one final time and remain that way. 
Before this 24 hour period is up, though, a mortal who encounters the Pandoran may find a very strange corpse, indeed, and scavengers and other animals might consume some of the flesh, potentially creating one of the cryptae, which were discussed in the first video of the series. Once a Pandoran in dormancy is exposed to Azoth once more, it awakens hungry from its hibernation. Disquiet. Pandorans cause disquiet in mortals, but the results of this sense of discomfort and denial are dramatically different with them. When a Promethean or Pandoran causes disquiet, it fuels the latent flux within. In Prometheans, who have their own Azothic resources to battle the upwelling of flux, this effect manifests as torment. Pandorans possess no such defense, however, and disquiet can suddenly strengthen the flux to such a degree that the Pandoran is thrown into dormancy. A Pandoran with a Pyros pool of zero and no immediate access to new Pyros becomes dormant. Half broken Promethean, half monster, a Pandoran instills a disquiet of fear and insanity in the mortals around it. Pandoran disquiet is driven by flux and is both terrible and immediate, requiring no buildup to infect those who see the creature. By comparison though, it immediately ends when the Pandoran departs the scene. For most normal humans, the strange encounter is rationalized away with short term memory loss or confusion. Rather than believe they just witnessed a monster turn into a statue before their very eyes, most people assume that they glanced up at the light as a play just right, making it look as though it moved. Only when they looked again did they see the truth of it. A victim of Pandoran disquiet is likely to suffer from nightmares or even traumatic flashes afterward. If he saw the Pandoran enter or emerge from dormancy, he might also develop an unreasonable fear of objects of that kind. Someone who glanced a little too long at a Pandoran before it succumbed to dormancy might see hallucinations for the rest of the night. Others might black out entirely, foggily coming to their senses the next morning in a strange part of town, with no recollection of how they got there or what they saw the night before. Supernatural beings do not suffer from Pandoran disquiet. When a mortal character is afflicted by Pandoran disquiet, the storyteller chooses a condition to represent the effect, stricken, terrified, or murderous. Where Promethean disquiet creates hate and fear, Pandoran disquiet generates disbelief and denial. Though the mortal has clearly seen the creature for the horror the Pandoran is, they deny this to themselves. This too feeds back onto the Pandoran. Instead of torment, the disbelief and denial manifest as dormancy. These two manifestations work together to a potent effect. As the creature enters a dormant state, disquiet works on the human mind, instilling extreme doubt over what the viewer just witnessed. Sometimes, however, dormancy doesn't overtake the Pandoran right away. Some Pandorans are particularly strong-willed, capable of fighting off its effects. In such cases, witnesses can only watch, in horror, as the Pandoran continues to act. In some instances, out of fear of dormancy, Pandorans have been known to suddenly turn and attack a mortal who has stumbled into their presence. The denial caused by Pandoran disquiet is quite powerful, fed by the warping, badness-inducing flux that is the essence of the Pandoran. As a result, human perceptions aren't the only things that are affected by it. Even recording devices manifest some strange flaw or disruption. Photographs develop as blurs, or simply black in film. Video cameras succumb to a burst of unexpected static or lack of focus. Sound recording equipment picks up only a distorted garble. This has no negative repercussions on the Pandoran, or the mortal viewing the media. As a result, Pandorans generally try to avoid being seen by humans. Should the Pandoran be within the sight of a Promethean, however, it is greatly resistant to the dormancy-inducing effects of the disquiet it creates. Prometheans who flee into areas populated by mortals are not guaranteed safety from Pandoran attack, but Pandorans are cautious nonetheless. As a result, Prometheans are often safest from Pandorans in the company of mortals. Their proximity to mortals brings its own disquiet, however, leading to terrible situations. Packed Instinct this pack bond is formed once Pandorans have spent time in one another's company. Generally speaking, this takes about a week, though a new Pandoran that accompanies others in the pack hunting or defending the lair generally melds into the pack bond fairly quickly. Hierarchy in a Pandoran pack is established almost immediately, with the most powerful Pandorans dominating those beneath them. The Pandoran with the highest rank in the pack runs it, with only occasional scuffles among members of the pack necessarily to reassert occasional dominance. The exception to this is the Sublimati. Sublimati do share in this bond, but only if they dominate the pack. Upon finding a Pandoran pack, 
the Sublimatus, must usually kill the highest ranking Pandoran in the pack before the others will accept the domination of the Sublimatus. For this reason, many Sublimati learn the Pandoran transmutation mantle of lordship. The pack bond is really only a benefit while members of the same pact are within one another's proximity. Members of the pack do not telepathically know what others in the pact are doing a block away, but on the same floor of a building, or in the same junkyard for instance, to be seen by one is to be seen by them all. Come on buddy, come on, dinner time, humans taste better than cat, I promise. He's insane. He's awesome. Purity of intention. Pandorans are characterized as frighteningly silent creatures, seeming, moving, and acting of one accord, and with good reason. The pact bond allows the pact to know what the leader of the pact desires accomplished, and all contribute to the best of their ability to fulfill this. Awareness Anytime one of the Pandorans in a pact notices something, all the Pandorans that the Pandorans share the pact bond with in its proximity are aware of it. Thus, it is quite difficult to surprise Pandorans. This operates whether or not the pact leader is in the area. It should be noted that Prometheans, even the Sentamani, cannot come to dominate pacts in this fashion. They must use the mantle of lordship transmutation in order to seize control of a pact, and even then they do not truly share in its pact bond, unless they possess the horde and unity Pandoran transmutation. Agenda Any Pandoran's motivations relate back to its desire to stay alive, if its existence can truly be called life. Reproduction Pandorans cannot make more of their own, because their genesis is the failed creation of a Promethean. Since Pandorans lack Azoth, they cannot perform the generative act, not even with the same slim chance that Prometheans have. But that doesn't mean that a Pandoran couldn't try to create more like itself, especially if it has evolved to the point that it remembers something of its birth. How might a Pandoran go about trying to reproduce? Connecting reproduction to sexual activity is probably quite beyond most of the mockeries, although a more humanoid Pandoran might try rutting with another of the beasts, or even a captive Promethean, if it had the chance to observe living creatures engaging in sex. Think Dredden from Splice. Therefore, the way to create more Pandorans is to infuse human flesh with flux. If a Pandoran grasps this concept, it might undertake any number of unsavory practices in an attempt to make a family. For instance, if a reproduction-minded Pandoran captures a Promethean, it might hollow out the unfortunate created out and try to cough up some humor, in much the same way a Promethean would when attempting the generative act. A Pandoran trying to claw out a Promethean's innards and replace them with its own bileless fluids in hopes of turning the created into a Pandoran might have no hope of actually achieving its goal, but that's a small consolation to the victim. A Pandoran with a sanguine victory transmutation might assume its liquid form and force its way into a Promethean's body through any available orifice, all in hope that its natural flux would pollute the Promethean's Azoth and cause their body to sunder itself. Another option, of course, is for the Pandoran to take the captive Promethean to a place with a flux rating and immobilize them there, letting the natural taint of the area do the work for it. The Pandoran might even get the idea that if the Promethean were already divided into smaller chunks, they would take on the flux taint faster. Farm most Pandorans hunt and feed from Prometheans, either by consuming their pyrus rich flesh or tearing them open to feast on precious vitriol. But what if an especially cunning Pandoran got the idea to create a sustainable resource? Consider, an Algan investigating a haunted house awakens a small pack of Pandorans. They attack and immobilize them, chaining them in the basement and tearing out their tongues so they cannot scream. Because the house is haunted, the Algan regains Pyros every night, as well as every morning when the sun rises. And since they are only immobilized, not being actively harmed, they are a constant food source. They will eventually starve to death unless their captors think to feed them. But if they resist the urge to gorge upon their flesh, they will heal any damage the Pandorans inflict in a few days. A Promethean in such a predicament could conceivably languish until the Pandorans grow powerful enough that they don't feel they need them anymore, at which time they may eat them or try to use their body to create more Pandorans. Then again, the Promethean might be overcome by the flux around them and become a Sentimonis potentially embracing their captors and eventually coming to rule them. This isn't to suggest that flux exposure can force a Promethean to change their refinement, merely that prolonged time in such a place might induce a kind of Stockholm Syndrome in the unfortunate created. It also acts as a flytrap in the form of Azothic Radiance. As other Prometheans search out the source of the Azoth they feel, the Pandorans lay traps and ambushes, picking them off and consuming their Pyros. 
Mobility. One of the greatest limitations that Pandorans have is their inability to move freely. Human population density, combined with the scarcity of their prey, means that a Pandoran has a much greater chance of succumbing to dormancy than of finding a suitable meal. As such, an intelligent Pandoran might try to seek out a means of moving undetected through the human masses. A small Pandoran might tear open a Promethean, crawl into their chest cavity, and try to use them as a mask or a vehicle. Yeah, this is uh, Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles in the World of Darkness. This approach is especially appropriate for Pandorans capable of assuming liquid or gaseous forms. A Pandoran might follow a Promethean around, not feeding on them, or letting them go after attacking them at least, but attacking any other created that comes near them. A Sublimanus or Sentimanus might incapacitate a Promethean and keep them in a vehicle, in effect creating a mobile azothic radiance field. The enterprising Pandoran, now almost immune to dormancy, could travel around awakening others of its kind to work toward whatever long-term goal it likes. Revenge if Prometheans are the children of the Divine Fire, they're troublesome, vicious siblings of the Pandorans, the bastards of the Divine Fire. Every Pandoran could have been a Promethean, and vice versa. An especially aware Pandoran might feel anger or envy toward its Promethean siblings. They might recognize the Azoth of their creator in another Promethean, and strive to take it, either out of jealousy, spite, or a perverse kind of hope that in consuming this Promethean, they might gain what they had. The Pandoran doesn't necessarily want to eat its target so much as inflict as much pain on them as possible. As an aside, a Promethean who confronts a Pandoran sibling almost certainly completes a milestone. Service Other supernatural denizens of the World of Darkness might appreciate having servants with a Pandoran's ferocity. Vampires and mages, especially, might find a way to make use of these creatures. And since they do not send Pandorans into dormancy, a mutually agreeable arrangement might be reached. A Pandoran in service to a supernatural being might act as a spy, a bodyguard, or an assassin. Some inquisitive beings might even prefer to use Pandorans as test subjects in the quest to learn about Flux or Pyros. As long as a Pandoran is getting a safe place to live and some Pyros to feed on, it might consider itself lucky. But there's the rub. Where would a mage or a vampire get Pyros? A mage's mana, or a vampire's blood, though mystically potent, is not charged with the divine fire, and therefore carries no appeal for the Pandorans. In order to feed a Pandoran servant, a master needs a Promethean. A Pandoran might therefore work for shelter and safety rather than Pyros, unless the master, for whatever reason, has also captured one of the created. Such a situation, while not impossible, stretches the boundary of plausibility just a bit. These masters have a Promethean captured somewhere in their base. Think about that for a second. And all the implications that brings. Far more likely is the Pandoran who goes deliberately searching for a Sentimatus, or, for truly conniving monsters, tries to nudge a Promethean away from their present refinement and toward the path of flux. In the presence of such a master, the Pandoran is not only resistant to dormancy, but is never far away from a potential meal. Division Division is a power inherent to all Pandorans, though it only manifests under specific circumstances. When a Pandoran is killed with most of its power unexpended, that power animates the remnants of the corpse, forming a wholly new Pandoran. Pandorans that are exposed to too much Azoth will also actually birth more Pandorans, their bodies tearing them into two or more pieces, and each of those pieces developing into a new Pandoran. Any time a Pandoran is in the field of Azothic Radiance from an Azoth that is more than double the Pandoran's rank, and it has a full Pyros pool, roll one die per point of Azoth above the doubled rank. For example, the player of a rank 2 Pandoran exposed to the Azothic Radiance of a character with Azoth 6 would roll two dice, doubling its rank equals 4, which is then subtracted from 6. If the score rolls 0 or 1 success, the Pandoran does not split. When the Pandoran splits, it becomes a number of Pandorans equal to the successes rolled, each of a rank 1. The original Pandoran is not reduced in captivity in any way, though it does take one lethal damage wound per Pandoran created. You can also simplify this rule with 2e. As a result, newly spawned Pandorans begin their existences in a feeding frenzy. Evolution Praikibitati 
A prygibitatus is as much the circumstances that birthed it as it is the creature unto itself. Their blink of an eye existence ensures most created never have to deal with one. Occasionally, though, the creature lasts much longer than its brethren and becomes an urban nightmare. When a Pandoran hungers for Azoth with the desperation of a starving man, it also needs flux to retain its broken alchemy. A Pandoran exposed to too much pyros, as in its well-fed, it enters flux hunger. These Pandorans seem to go nuts, suddenly leaping in among and attacking their fellows. As they touch another Pandoran, they absorb its essence and flesh into themselves, creating strange, horrific amalgamations. When a Pandoran meets the conditions for entering this cannibalistic frenzy, its player rolls composure. Failure on this roll indicates the creature enters one of these cannibalistic feeding frenzies, referred to as flux hunger by Prometheans who know of it. Generally speaking, this only happens when the Pandoran has access to an imprisoned Promethean or other the reliable source of Pyros. As the Pandoran devours those of its own kind in an orgy of hunger, it grows and mutates at an astounding rate and becomes a Prycipitatus. A Prycipitatus is horrible to look upon, as it is consistently changing from one deformed shape to another. When such a creature consumes half the Pyros of another Pandoran, that Pandoran is automatically merged with a composite entity. This process cannot be resisted by the Pandoran, and Prometheans are not subject to it. Only other Pandorans may be so absorbed. A Prycipitatus need look Look nothing like the subsumed Pandorans, instead sprouting impossibly long limbs, ending in grasping claws, orifices eager for flesh, or other monstrous features as flux molds the Precipitatus like plague-ridden clay. When a Pandoran ends every day with a full Pyros pool for a continuous week, it becomes chemically imbalanced with too much Pyros and too little flux. Some claim that certain Centimani keep their Pandorans well fed in hopes of inducing a flux hunger. A Centimanus might deliberately keep their Pandoran pets at full Pyros in an attempt to trigger flux hunger, so they might add a precipitatus to their routine. The composite creature possesses all the transmutations of the creatures that are part of the amalgam. Their physical attributes and skills are the highest of those possessed by the Pandorans in the amalgamation. The creature also increases in size, gaining plus one size per two Pandorans absorbed. The composite creature's pyros pool is equal to the sum of all the pyros pools of the conjoined creatures. Additionally, Precipitati manifests one of three strange bestowment-like abilities. Sentimani believe they have identified three base Precipitati, which they named after the Hecatonchores, the hundred-handed children of the titans of Greek mythology. The Precipitatus gains an additional power based on the highest of its strength, presence, or intelligence. In case of a tie, intelligence trumps presence, and both trump strength. First edition had you rolling for what one would get in a three-way tie, but lore-wise, Tui's rules make way more sense. Briarius the Vigorous These are terribly strong creatures. A Precipitatus, who has strength as its defining attribute, adds another plus one strength per two Pandorans merged. This boost can take strength above the normal physical attribute limits of such creatures without limit. This is the bestowment of Precipitati with great strength. Cotus the Furious a Prycipitatus, who has presence as its defining attribute, instills a numbing fear in those around it. Prycipitati actually infect the world around them with an emotional spore that causes madness in those that experience it. Animals react with tremendous fear and rage, attacking obstacles in their frenzy to get away. Animals flee without a roll, snapping and snarling at anything that comes in their path. Sentient creatures must score key Pandoran's rank plus one per additional merged Pandoran successes on an extended resolve plus composure roll or suffer the fugue condition. This does not affect supernatural beings, though it does affect those mortals touched by supernaturals, such as ghouls and sleepwalkers. This is the bestowment of Prycipitati with great presence. Jai Gs, the Cunning Called the Great Limbed Jaiji's Precipitati are incredibly physically hale. A Precipitatus, who has intelligence as its main attribute, is quick to learn and adapt. Precipitati with this manifestation regenerate one batching point of damage per turn, or one lethal damage per two turns. This is the bestowment of Precipitati with great intelligence, who are the living embodiment of the mind over matter principle. If using 2e, it may add one new dread power per three merged Pandorans. Fortunately, the nature of flux is not coherent enough to maintain a Precipitatus for long, and the monstrosity is usually short-lived. 
Praecipitati exist for only one scene at most. Generally speaking, they are short-lived monstrosities that rage through the place where they were birthed, and perhaps part of adjoining areas, until they fall back apart, the battle between Flux and Azoth within them abating. The Praecipitatus falls apart naturally when the scene ends, or when it is rendered destroyed due to damage. Pandoran disquiet can also cause this to happen much more rapidly. If the Praecipitatus falls apart naturally, the merged Pandorans return to their previous state and divide remaining Pyros evenly amongst them. If there is not enough to divide, start with the higher ranking Pandorans first. Damage dealt is distributed evenly among the lowest ranked Pandorans until no damage is left. If a Praecipitatus is destroyed by damage, all lowest ranked Pandorans take damage equal to the full damage the Praecipitatus suffered. Nonetheless, those mortals who experience the sight of one of the Praecipitati know that they have experienced something that causes them tremendous fear, but they generally assume it was a hallucination or drug trip of some kind. Sublimati these are the most painful mockeries, unborn who come so close to the real deal. The Sublimati sense it too, the pilgrimage that was almost theirs, the love and the care of a creator and it makes them even more dangerous. The Sublimati, also known as the Refined, are very different from the Pandoran Brethren. A Sublimatus has evolved. They have risen from savagery. Sublimati are highly intelligent and fully sentient, capable of raising their intelligence and manipulation attributes to human levels. In game terms, five dots. The creature's intellect is constantly growing and turning in on itself, devouring its own tail like a snake when sprouting new and terrible mutations. Their intelligence is only matched by their madness. Sublimati can also learn merits, and sometimes even Promethean transmutations. In all other ways, however, they are like other Pandorans, including the need to feed. Genesis Post Amalgam When a Praecipitati breaks apart, the player of the key Pandoran may make a stamina plus composure roll. If that roll gains a number of successes equal to 6 minus the key Pandoran's rank, if successful, the Pandoran becomes a Sublimatus and may divide a number of dots equal to its rank among mental and social attributes, at least one of which must be spent on intelligence or manipulation. It also gains a number of dots worth of dread powers or flux transmutations equal to its rank. Sublimati who found sentience in the melding of bodies, that is the Praecipitatus, tend to be pack and group oriented. At first, this inclination is focused primarily on establishing and maintaining a pack of Pandorans, easing the means by which the Sublimatus might acquire a more permanent source of Pyros. Many such Sublimati find the urge toward growth and establishment of organization, or at least numbers. Sublimati who are born from the Precipitatus understand the value of cooperation and teamwork. Sublimati often establish webs of contracts, student service, and even worshippers in some case. Sublimati have been known to try and organize other Sublimati, vast networks of Pandorans, and even humans, usually through indirect communication, but sometimes through the use of those immune to Pandoran disquiet, or by transmutations that protect them from the dormancy while they are in the presence of mortals for a while. A Pandoran that has devoured Promethean Vitriol can too evolve into a Sublimatus by spending that Vitriol on intelligence or manipulation dots. If an existing Pandoran devours a Promethean's Vitriol, it can also become a Sublimatus. The Storyteller rolls the Pandoran's Resolve plus Composure. If successful, the creature may spend Vitriol to purchase intelligence or manipulation dots and become a Sublimatus. If the roll fails, the Vitriol is corrupted and lost to Flux. Those Sublimati, however, who gain their sentience through the ingestion of vitriol, literally transforming themselves, tend toward more solitary efforts. Such Pandorans are the result of their own efforts, and often consider the sudden enlightenment and separation that comes from the others of their packs as a result to be a great boon. These Sublimati generally find the most benefit in their own company and effort, refusing to be weighed down by a group or pack, mastering the skills and tricks necessary for a solitary Pandoran to survive on its own. Promethean Birth If a Promethean who creates a Pandoran has any unspent vitriol points, the new Pandoran can try to steal those points and spend them on intelligence or manipulation dots, thus becoming a Sublimatus from birth. Hunger a Sublimatus has learned to harvest the tiny spark of divine fire inside mortals, meaning it can consume human flesh to gain pyros and avoid dormancy. This consumption yields only half the pyros eating Promethean flesh would. Most Sublimati feel it lacks a certain je ne sais quoi, pleasing to the refined palate, and so are still likely to hunt Prometheans over mortals. Relationships 
Likewise, rather than the Pandoran pets with which the Sentamani like to surround themselves, a Sublimanus' relationship to any Sentamanus it accompanies is more akin to a partnership in a cabinet of horrors than one of subservience. Prometheans often mistake Sublimati for Sentamani, though the freaks and mockeries themselves can tell the difference just fine. While a Sentamanus is a Promethean in the Cripes of Flux, a Sublimanus is a Pandoran who has managed to evolve, albeit barely, above pure chaos. This has led some created to wonder if a Sublimanus might evolve even further, becoming a Sentamanus, and from there, a pilgrimage abiding citizen who might reach New Dawn. However, they are not human and have no desire to become human. Heresies and Cults Sublimati sometimes are responsible for founding radical new philosophies, moral systems, and even full-blown religions, usually with themselves in some position of power, whether concealed or, rarely, though possible with some transmutations, acting as direct messiahic figures. They attract other Sublimati, or even Sentimani, Prometheans. The philosophies such figures espouse are brutal in their honesty and monstrous insight of the world. The Epimetheans Epimetheans name themselves for the titan Epimetheus, the brother of Prometheus to whom Pandora was given. Pandora released the ills of the world into it with her insatiable curiosity. Epimetheus is held as the patron and spiritual ideal of this group. Epimetheans compare Prometheans to the cattle of the world, who get through their day-to-day -day affairs by telling themselves that this isn't the best life has to offer. They find meaning in the past, looking behind them to see where they've been and how far they have come, rather than focusing on the misty horizon of what might be. Epimetheans understand that they should take pride in their heights that they have achieved. Once, they were mindless monsters, slavering and snarling at one another for a few scraps of meat from a convenient Promethean body. As a result, Epimetheans tend to come off as somewhat nostalgic, reflective braggarts with a tendency toward impulsivity. When in one another's company, they love to tell stories of where they've been and what they've done, congratulating one another on their successes. In seeking to outdo one another in their heights of achievement, they are something of an informal social club rather than an organization per se. Membership is by invitation. The closest thing they have to future plans is their regular annual midsummer meetings in Berlin in Germany, Detroit or San Diego in the United States, and Medellin in Colombia. When midsummer rolls around, most of the Epimetheans make their way to one of these locales, whichever is closest, to meet with the others, and they spend approximately a week in one another's company. Sustenance is to be had, as the Epimetheans take pride in showing off those Prometheans they've managed to capture, though rarely more than one or two per site each year, and at the end of the week, they break off in pairs and threes, deciding to accompany one another in their travels to see what happens. They aid one another, or end up as rivals in some city until they part from one another's company until next midsummer. It is worth noting that Sentimani are sometimes referred to as Epimetheans by other Prometheans. It is generally assumed that this confusion isn't accidental. It is possible that the Epimetheans once included some Sentimani. It is also possible, however, that some young Promethean who never heard of a Sublimanus assumed this strange fraternity was made up of Sentimani. It may also simply be that this organization decided to deliberately take its name from the nickname for Sentimani, in hopes of throwing off any suspicion from Prometheans who may find out about it. However this confusion came about, the Epimetheans do not hesitate to take advantage of it when they can. The Cult of Chains this cult was founded by the Lady of Chains. The Lady of Chains has appeared in many parts of the world, and many Prometheans have fallen into her clutches. It is said that she first appeared in Russia in the late 1800s. She was a result of a Tammuz Promethean's failed attempt to create a mate. However, it didn't take long for her to expand her scope, eventually rising from savagery all the way from Pandoran to Sublimati, and she's been sighted all around the globe. The Cult of Chains is her followers. Outwardly, the Cult of Chains is a collection of loosely affiliated free agents, prison wardens and guards, S&M club owners, dominatrices, criminals, and a ragtag collection of others. The only thing that binds them together is the fact that all of them have some fascination with the philosophy espoused by the Lady of Chains, that imprisonment is actually a form of sublime freedom. Flux, as she understands it, is the essence of immobility and inaction. Witness, after all, the stagnating effects Flux has on the environment and the very dormancy of the Pandorans. Yet, Flux is simultaneously a warping, changing principle. Implicit in Flux is the essence of 
madness. Likewise, imprisonment manifests these traits. The one imprisoned is forbidden from traveling or even, in some cases, moving at all. Yet, the changes that imprisonment creates in people are so dramatic that they are, for all intents and purposes, entirely different people following the imprisonment. The greater the limitation, the greater and more extreme the change. This, she believes, is the essence of flux. It is outwardly stagnating, while creating greater transformation within that supposed freedom does. In their may very well be something to this, for the Lady of Chains has demonstrated tremendous knowledge of and mastery over Flux, so much so that she is often sought out not only by other sublimati seeking to learn at her feet, but also Prometheans, particularly those of the Sentimanus refinement. The Cult of Chains exists for one ultimate purpose, to serve the Lady of Chains. Cult members aid one another, recognizing one another through the Secret Society's ring, which is a delicate chain of tiny, black iron links looped around one's finger. Cult members aid one another in whatever ways they can, but they know that one type of command is not to be ignored. Any request made in the Lady's name must be met, if at all possible, where the consequences are dire. Though no one dares to name these consequences, nearly every member of the cult is aware of at least one other member who simply disappeared, usually for either talking about the cult or refusing requests made in the Lady's name. One of the primary tasks that the cult is called upon is aiding and capturing or securing Prometheans for the benefit benefit of the lady and her subordinate sublimati. Prison vans help transport them, underground sex clubs help hold them, private detectives and underworld informants help hunt them down. Such imprisonment, though it invariably involves some of the Promethean's flesh being eaten, isn't always a monstrous experience. Or at least, sometimes, it is as sublime as it is horrific. The Lady of Chains has taken a single, extraordinary measure to ensure the safety and sanctity of her cult. She has gone public with it. Incorporating as a non-profit organization that often holds fundraisers benefiting women shelters, literacy programs, support groups for the family members of convicts and other strangely connected programs, the Cult of Chains is a tax-exempt organization. It even has its own website, complete with a forum of users 18 years and older to discuss sadomasochism, bondage, and domination, and other similar concepts. The Athoni the Athoni are based in a small island off the eastern coast of Spain in the Mediterranean called Isla del Aguila, which means Island of Eagles. Where the cult of chains and the Epimetheans hardly seem to deserve the term cult, the Athoni are something else entirely. Founded by a triumvirate of ancient sublimati, the Athoni revere a spiritual manifestation of flux, which appears as an eagle. Named Ethon for the eagle that consumed Prometheus's liver every other day, the triumvirate called the Sons of the Eagle claimed to receive visions of Ethon during their bouts of dormancy. Once a year, on the winter solstice, a Sentimanus or Siren, known only as the Alkalite, comes to the island, and his azothic radiance awakens the triumvirate. At this time, the Sublimati, who belong to the Ethoni, gather here to hear their words, while they feed upon the vitriol the Alkalite has accumulated in the year since. At other times, the Athoni are skilled hunters. When one of the Athoni are destroyed, members of the cult do their best to track down the Athoni's remains and bring them, powdered, to spread upon the winds of the high cliffs off Isla del Aguila, freeing the soul to soar with Ethon. Part 2 Creation Rank and Traits Pandorans have the following traits and abilities. If not explicitly specified, treat Sublimati as Pandorans. Now before I get ahead of myself, let me just explain something real quick. So, depending on what edition you have, whether it's first or second edition, there is a table that indicates what for this edition you should use as your traits for Pandorans. So for this section, the way I determined what edition to use was both. Let me explain. Most of the variables used to create a Pandoran carried over from 1E into 2E. However, others didn't out of what appears to be unaware omission rather than choice. If you really cross compare the tables between both editions, and then go to calculate your stats based upon what is given in the tables, you're actually missing some things. To determine some of these stats, you kinda need them. Yeah, I know. Is it kinda like a hybridization of the rules? Yeah, but it's complete. 
You can't really negotiate on outputs when your input variables aren't even said to begin with. So before people get mad, that's just kind of what I did, just so you have a better idea of how to actually construct these things. Also, this is kind of the first time we've done something like this, so please let us know if you like this system or not, or you want us really just to use a specific one. But like I said, you can't really do that in this instance. Rank. Pandorans have a rank rated 1 to 5, based on the total amount of pyros they've stolen in 2E. All other traits derive from rank. Low-ranking Pandorans hunt in packs when they can, while high-ranking Pandorans may prefer to work alone. Due to their violent and chaotic lives, it is exceedingly rare to see a non-sublimanus Pandoran above rank 3. In 1st edition, Pandorans are ranked 1 through 5, based on how long the Pandoran has been in existence. Rank determines how powerful the Pandoran is, as well as its age out of dormancy, from 3 months to over 100 years. Virtues and Vice all possess a vice, but none possess virtues. Attributes Attribute distribution change the most between editions. Make sure you consult the tables listed in each book for what you'd like to use. Pandorans begin with an automatic dot in all physical attributes, and one dot in all mental and social attributes, except intelligence and manipulation, which have zero dots each. Pandorans gain the ability to speak when they have at least one dot in both intelligence and manipulation. Until a Pandoran has a single dot in both intelligence and manipulation, it remains an animalistic and bestial creature, running purely on instinct. Pandorans may not purchase social skills, except for animal ken and intimidation, until they have at least one dot each in intelligence and manipulation. They may not purchase mental skills until they have at least one dot in intelligence. Sublimati Intelligence and Manipulation Maximum This is the maximum number of dots a Sublimati Pandoran can have in its intelligence and manipulation attributes. Skills Pandorans may not purchase social skills except for animal ken and intimidation, nor may they purchase mental skills. This restriction does not apply to Sublimati. Merits Pandorans do not generally develop merits. The Sublimati, however, can and do learn them. Some include Incorruptible at 4 dots, Fighting Style, Multi-Limbed Combat, 1 to 4 dots, including Outnumbered, Manned Handle, Protect Attack, Bountiful Blows, Willpower, Resolve plus Composure, Initiative, Dexterity plus Composure, Defense, Higher of Dexterity and Wits plus Athletics. They made this more congruent in 2E. Speed. Strength plus Dexterity plus Species Factor 6 Pandoran or 5 Sublimatus. Originally, that last variable was Wits. 2E made them faster. Size, 4, smaller than most humans. Health, Stamina plus Size. Morality, they do not possess any morality or integrity. Pyrus, Pyrus Pool, total Pyrus Pool is determined by rank. Pandorans can spend up to their rank in Pyros per turn. They must spend one point of Pyros per day to sustain their existence and can only regain Pyros by consuming Promethean flesh. A Pandoran with no more Pyros left is susceptible to dormancy. Maximum Pyros This gives the maximum normal Pyros pool a Pandoran may possess. A Pandoran may spend up to its rank in Pyros per turn. Okay, now it gets a little tricky depending on what edition you're running. I'm going to present both, and once the recording is finished, you'll see why I did so. 1E, Transmutations. This indicates the number of dots in Pandoran transmutations the Pandoran typically possesses. In 2nd edition, this would coincide with rank from 1E if comparing tables and removing the age column, making it arbitrary. Pandorans have a certain number of transmutations based on their rank. 2E, Dread Powers. Pandorans begin their existence with Consume, Vitriol, Divide, Sense Vitriol, and Track Pyros. In addition to these, Pandorans may purchase an average number of Dread Powers based on rank. Some Pandorans might have slightly more or fewer purchases. Sublimati may also use the Flux Transmutation. Each distillment is a separate power. Max Pyros from 1E's Calm transform into this for 2E. Pandorans also possess the following Promethean-like traits and capabilities. Electroshock Therapy functions as the Promethean trait. Like Prometheans, Pandorans are healed by the touch of electricity. Disquiet. Pandorans do cause disquiet, although this is flux-based. Pandoran Constitution. While Pandorans must consume Promethean flesh to devour the pyros inside, they do not require nourishment in the traditional sense. Additionally, they are immune to poison and disease. Speech. Most Pandorans cannot speak coherently, although they can shriek, hiss, and howl. Some learn a simple word or phrase to repeat, rip, 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 mommy, mommy, etc. 
Sublimati can speak normally. Superlative Endurance Pandorans possess the strong resistances to pain and fatigue that Prometheans do. They do not, however, have the ability to resurrect themselves from death, as this is a function of Azoth. It functions as the Promethean trait, with the exception of resurrection from death, because it requires Azoth. Transhuman Potential functions as the Promethean trait. Pandorans may expend their pyros to increase their attributes, but Pandorans may only use this to increase their physical attributes. Pandorans do not have the following Promethean-like traits or capabilities. Alchemical Packs Pandorans may not enter into alchemical packs. This ability to form a gestalt unity is a trait of Azoth. Pandorans are too infused with the divisiveness of Flux to replicate the feat. Azoth Pandorans do not have an Azoth trait. Disquiet. Pandorans do cause a form of disquiet, but its manifestation is distinctly different from that of Prometheans. Reaction of disquiet in humans inflict dormancy on Pandorans. Pandoran disquiet does not create wastelands. Torment. Pandorans do not suffer from torment. The Mockeries. Take note, this is from 1E and aren't presented in 2E. Five are the noble lineages of the Prometheans, but it is from accidents and terrible fates of each of these lineages that are born the Pandorans. Likewise, there are five breeds of Pandorans, each born from the sundering of one of the lineages. Prometheans refer to these false lineages as the Mockeries, but the rare few of the Sublimati who have spoken on the subject indicate that they are, in fact, the mirror images of the lineages. If the lineages are the humors and elements expressed through Azoth, the mockeries are the humors and elements expressed through Flux. A Promethean might be created in the traditional lineage manner herself, but for one reason or another, not use those same rituals when the time comes for her to create progeny. While a storyteller might rule that any deviation from the traditional ritual may result in a Pandoran, or that deviations still have a chance of resulting in an offspring of the creator's lineage, family lines become twisted. A Promethean might not, for a variety of reasons, use the same generative ritual that was used to create her. She might have been abandoned during or shortly after the creation process by a selfish creator who saw her only as a step in their own pilgrimage. Likewise, she may have been separated from a creator before the generative ritual could be taught. The Saturnine Night is a dangerous path to walk, and there are certainly far more pertinent lessons to communicate early on in a Promethean's existence than the intricacies of the generative act. Regardless of the reason, if a Promethean does not manage to learn the generative act from their creator or other sources, they might find themselves feeling the drive to create offspring and have nothing but a vague instinct about how to go about it. Other times, Promethean lineages deviate not out of necessity, but choice. A throng of the created might decide to create another Promethean as a joint effort, as a symbol of their unity. Also note that only Prometheans can create these mockeries. Mortals cannot. Ishtari, Tammuz Mockery the great goddess Ishtar sent demons on her husband, Tammuz, and led to his demise. Those wretched Pandorans, spawned from the interference of Flux in the creation process of the Tammuz, are named for her. And like Ishtar herself, the Ishtari have nothing but rage and death for Tammuz and their Promethean brethren. As Ishtar made a descent into Hell, the Ishtari feel a tremendous affinity with the deep places of the Earth. They haunt cavern complexes, subway tunnels, tombs, and ancient ruins, dwelling among the tall, silent stone walls walls, hungering, preferring to trap Prometheans rather than destroy them outright. They imprison their prey and consume them slowly over time. Ishtari favor anything that leaves their prey unable to escape and affords plenty of time to savor both the fear and the flesh of their foes. Death comes only after a long and lingering time of captivity, and the Ishtari are known for being willing to do things to help ensure the continued survival of their captives, including bringing them food and access to electricity to allow them to heal. Ishtari seem to instinctively know that death causes a cessation of the Azothic Radiance from a Promethean. Over the centuries, others of the Tammuz have been formed as their progenitor was, directly from the clay of the earth. Most of the lineage, however, do not even know that such a thing is possible. Some of those who hold the knowledge do not share it because they believe that it is impossible for one of the clay-created Tammuz to achieve their great work. They are suddenly destined to die unredeemed. Others hold it secret because they believe that the chances of creating a Pandoran are significantly higher when using an earthen form rather than a flesh one. Dormant form. Dormant Ishtari seem to be pieces of masonry, random boulders, or other stones or earth features. They are rarely noticed, for they often blend into their surroundings, seeming to be a simple part of the landscape. Bestowment Ishtari possess the Pandoran transmutation inertia as a bestowment. They are notorious for their ability to ground out the workings of the Azoth, forcing their prey to use their own strength and wits to survive. 
Sublimati. Ishtari Sublimati are strange, distant, cold creatures. Their intellect is cruel and dedicated to their goals with unflinched resolve. Ishtari Sublimati are rarely content with enslaving other Pandorans. They relish the keeping of Promethean captives, particularly those of the Tammuz lineage, who hate slavery most of all. Weakness. It takes greater Azothic Radiance to rouse the Ishtari from dormancy. Consider the level of Azothic Radiance to be one point lower for the purpose of determining whether or not Ishtari awaken. Additionally, they require two turns to fully emerge from dormancy, rather than the normal one turn. The most famous sublimati of this mockery is arguably the Lady of Chains. Renders Algen Mockery Though the Algen were once rent apart by demons and put back together by shamans, Render Pandorans are driven by a singular understanding that the primal destiny of these and other Prometheans is not to be whole. That which was put together unnaturally must be rent asunder once more. Renders seek to rip apart those Prometheans they consider prey. They are driven by the urge to use their wicked, tearing talons and not stop, until all that remains are wet chunks of once dead meat, sodden in the alchemic muck that serves Prometheans as blood. Renders are quick, moving smoothly, and with unwholesome speed. They have joints in places they shouldn't, or perhaps their limbs don't quite move as expected. Renders are deeply unsettling, prone to invoking disquiet quite rapidly. Most who see them are likely to think they are aliens or demons. Those captured by Render Pandorans are likely to be kept in excruciating pain. A Render is likely to simply remove parts of the body that might lead to trouble, such as arms and legs, and then consume the Promethean at its leisure, always leaving rent, torn flesh in the aftermath of its feasting. Renders look like demons or other strange, otherworldly horrors. All of them sport a set of wicked talons, and their eyes are strangely misty, as though filmed over in cataracts. They are thin and rangy, and it is unnerving to watch them move. Dormant Form When in dormancy, renders appear as natural features of the surrounding area, especially large plant life. One might appear to be a tree or fallen log in a forested area, or it might blend into the muck of a swampy terrain. Some might even climb into trees and seem to be part of the foliage and branches above. Bestowment. Renders possess the Pandoran transmutation scurry, two dots, and bizarre weaponry, claws, two dots, as bestowments. Sublimati. Render sublimati are paranoid creatures. They know that an immaterial state of being exists, and they often catch glimpses of it. Unfortunately, this also means that render sublimati usually mistake simple shifts in temperature, movement out of the corner of their eyes, and unexplained noises as something in this twilight state. They often surround themselves with charms and wardings, hoping to scare away any spirits. They are terribly cruel and callous creatures, finding joy only in the wet rip of rent flesh, which they don't always restrict to Prometheans. Weakness. Unlike Algen Prometheans, Renders are not aware of Twilight, save on the most instinctual level. Beings in Twilight are distinctly aware of Renders, however. Renders lose two dice in all resistance rolls to avoid being possessed by spirits and ghosts, and spirits can automatically sense this about Renders, using them for their own ends. Sebek, Osiris Mockery. I feel like I need to say that like the Emperor. Sebek. I love it. When Isis searched for the length and breadth of the Nile for the pieces of her brother husband Osiris, that she might make him whole again, only one piece remained undiscovered, for it had been consumed by the crocodiles of that river. The lack of this single piece kept Isis from being able to completely bring her beloved back to full life, leaving her about with only one option, to craft of his body a Promethean. Pandoran spawn from Osiris mishaps are referred to as Sebek, named for the crocodile god of ancient Egypt. Hungry and wicked, the Sebek Pandorans are quite savage in their pursuit. The Sebek are as brutal and forthright as the Osirids are subtle. The Sebek prefer to inhabit watery environments, and will use them in many of the same ways that crocodiles do, as a means of hiding the entries to their lairs, as a place to hide and wait in ambush, and as a medium in which to drown their prey. Sewers, riverways, canal systems, drainage outlets, swamps. These are all dangerous places for Prometheans, for they may harbor the ravenous Sebek. Most of the creatures are far too brutal and hungry to leave a foe alive. They simply leave their prey bound as thoroughly as possible, and avail themselves of a wicked bite of their prisoner whenever they desire. The Sebek appear quite well suited to watery environments. Their eyes possess nictitating membranes, clear eyelids that allow them to protect their eyes from filthy, stinging water, yet still see perfectly underwater. Sebek fingers and toes are often webbed, and they are long, sinuous creatures. Many of them develop transmutations that include thick tails, heavier armor, and the power to control animals. Dormant Form 
When Sebek are forced into dormancy, they assume forms that are reminiscent of nothing so much as various flotsam and river bottom debris. Logs, huge muddy chunks of stone, and similar debris are common. Even when they assume dormancy away from water, Sebek appear to be greatly waterlogged, clearly recently dredged up from a swamp or lake somewhere. Bestowman. All Sebek possess the armor, one dot, fangs, two dot, and Sebek's gift, one dot, Pandoran transmutations. Sublimati Sebek's sublimati are creatures possessed of a low cunning and affinity with the waterways. They usually construct impressive layers accessible only by water, and they almost always surround themselves with a variety of traps and other constructions that make the most out of their ability to breathe and move about in water easily. Sebek's sublimati rarely achieve the heights of intelligence that other sublimati do. Rather, their base cunning and hunger instincts take on a decisively more focused edge. Weaknesses Sebek Pandorans are ungainly when out of the water, suffering a minus one dice pool penalty on all dexterity based rolls. Additionally, only a successful resolve and composure roll allows them to overcome their great hunger for Azoth infused flesh, including to following orders to not eat a Promethean. Just as an aside, in 1E, where all these come from, in that book, there's a rank 5 Pandoran Sebek called the Great Albino Alligator, and it's a certified badass. The way you run Promethean is with giant mutated Frankenstein alligators. This is how this all works. Why does no one ever talk about Promethean? This stuff is so badass. Oh, my vampire. Oh, my mage. Listen, just read this book. You're going to love it. The Silent Galatea Mockery. It is the Logos, the word of creation, that animates the Galatea. But sometimes, the created who utters that word has done something wrong. The Logos take host only in perfection, and if the corpse imbued with the divine fire of the Galatea is imperfect, that holiest of words falls on deaf, dead ears. The urge of destruction is strong. The silent are consummate hunters, masters of remaining hidden. Their natural silence and their ability to fly serve them quite well. They use attacks that maul the flesh and mar the beauty of those they attack. Attractive Prometheans, particularly Galatides, arouse their ire, and more than one muse has been horribly scarred by the sudden attack of one of these beasts, its mouth stretch wide in a silent shriek of rage and hate. The silent also maim or even kill beautiful mortals they encounter. These brutes love nothing so much as to mutilate and forever scar the face of those they torment. It is generally agreed that the silent considers strips of flesh taken directly from the face of an imprisoned Promethean to be quite the delicacy, and they indulge every time they are capable. They are also completely incapable of uttering any sound. The Silent are the most hideous, possessed of terribly warped bones and unloved, discolored flesh. They move through the air on the terrifying wings of carrion insects, leather-winged scavengers, or black vulture feathers. They are constantly surrounded by the stench of rotting flesh. Theirs is a legacy of corruption and imperfection. Dormant Form the silent always take the form of something depicting a human form that has been marred, destroyed, or made ugly in some fashion. It is believed by some Prometheans that some of the broken or ugly statuary in some museums could very well be silent Pandorans in dormant forms, while others have been encountered that seem to be half-melted mannequins. Bestowment all silent possess the wings, four-dot, Pandoran transmutation, allowing flight as a reflexive action. Sublimati. Silent sublimati are jealous, strange creatures. They often watch from the shadows, keeping their terrible visages hidden as they plot intricate machinations to bring about the humbling of the beautiful. All silent sublimati find ways of communicating that do not require the spoken word, whether through the use of written messages, sign language, or even the development of transmutations that allow mental communication. Weaknesses. The silent are completely incapable of making any vocal sound. Additionally, any time they encounter a person with the striking looks merit or similar signs of tremendous beauty, the player must make a resolve plus composure roll for the Pandoran to resist immediately attacking the image of loveliness. In the case of human victims, this jealous violence does not override the Pandoran's cautious nature regarding the disquiet. Their assaults must simply be more clever. This weakness also applies to pieces of artwork and even billboards featuring advertisements with truly beautiful people in them. Example, the Harpy of Paris. 
The harpy is the queen of the roost, and she does not allow others to forget it. They go into detail in the book, but essentially, it's this really messed up, like, gargoyle harpy that flies over Paris and just has all these pigeons that she, like, throws at people. And I love it. I absolutely love everything about this book. Everything in this section of this book just speaks to me on such a, like, a primal level that I just love. Just imagine that. Imagine just a... I don't even know where to begin with this. Torchborn. Frankenstein mockery. The Frankenstein speak with fear of the Torchborn, embodiments of the fire that slays the created. The Torchborn seem driven to bring destruction by fire to any Prometheans they encounter. Torchborn Pandorans seem to prefer seared flesh when consuming a Promethean, and will do everything in their power to use flame in some fashion against those they hunt. They are quite cunning in setting up traps and pitfalls that involve flame, and are utterly fascinated with fire. Torchborn will stand in an open field, staring raptly at it, sometimes even reaching out to touch it. It is often the pain of such attempts that snaps them from their bliss. Although they love the flame, Torchborn are no more immune to fire than any other Pandoran is. Often, only the application of the Torchborn's crucible of flesh bestowment is necessary for success. Pandorans prefer to consume the flesh of the created chard while still attached. Torchborn have been known to to engage in such feasting techniques as setting a limb ablaze and then beginning to feast once it burns out, or dumping a small brazier of coals into an open torso of a Promethean and plucking out choice seared organ morsels as they can. They possess terribly black eyes that gleam like red coals in the darkness, and their skin is usually a waxy, blotched canvas of once burnt flesh. They stink of burning things. Dormant Form When the Torchborn assume their dormant form, they are mistaken for objects left over from a great fire. They seem to be charred, burnt, and melted things. In a city, they might appear as the remnants of a homeless camp's fire barrel that got out of control. In a wilderness area, they might seem to be seared boulders and charred dead trees. Bestowment All Torchborn possess a crucible of flesh Pandoran transmutation. Sublimati Torchborn sublimati are always cruel, enjoying watching those around them suffer from flame. Most of them are dedicated arsonists, and they derive perverse pleasure from witnessing the pain of those who are burnt. Their favorite victims, particularly unlucky Prometheans, often bear brands that mark them as the property of the monster. Weakness when a Torchborn is faced with a fire of campfire size or larger, the player must roll Resolve plus Composure, with a dice penalty equal to the size of the fire. Failure on this roll indicates that the Pandoran simply stands and gazes longingly into the flame. Any interruption to this reverie, another Pandoran striking him, an attack by an enemy, another Torchborn reaching into the flame and being burnt, snaps him back into consciousness. Additional Mockeries Carcinomas Zika Mockery Pandorans rarely show intelligence, but the Carcinomas are particularly mindless, brainless things that show no guile, throwing themselves hungrily at their prey with no finesse and no regard for survival. Only when a stronger ally directs them do they behave with anything approaching cunning. Dormant Form When dormant, the Carcinomas melt into stone, concrete, brick, or asphalt, becoming scorched nuclear silhouettes, albeit distorted ones, in much the same way as a Promethean with the victim's shadow bestowment. Bestowment. Carcinomas have the radioactive affinity bestowment. Similar to the Ziki, carcinomas cannot recover damage from electricity, instead healing through exposure to dangerous radiation. Sublimati. Carcinomas sublimati are quite possibly the strangest creatures anyone could ever hope not to meet. Although intelligent, their motives and actions are utterly alien. They make no sense at all. Something pursuing a goal with terrible conviction one moment and utterly ignoring it the next. They are as unpredictable and as uncertain as the atomic fission that created them. Weakness the carcinomas are always blind, and although they can hear, taste, and smell, they don't really have any superior senses to make up for this deficiency. If a character stands still and makes no sound, a carcinomas player must make a wits plus composure roll with a minus three dice pool penalty to be able to figure out where the character is. Human spawned. This majority is, by far, the most fortunate. Those rare few who do manage to grasp an understanding of the nature of the divine fire may find themselves far closer to succeeding, but in this case, a near miss may prove deadly. If a human is able to manipulate enough the divine spark, and yet somehow his experiment goes wrong, he may come up to share the burden that Promethean fear most, the creation of a Pandoran. This human-spawned creature is not a mockery, being unrelated to any Promethean lineage. 
The Pandoran is, however, just as deadly as any of its Promethean-born siblings. It comes into being possessing only the smallest amount of animating flux, and seems to know instinctively that the presence of its human creator threatens it with almost immediate dormancy. The Pandoran's first action, therefore, is to either flee or attempt to kill its creator. These human spawn Pandorans may very well explain the origins of other unique beings in the world of darkness. During the time of Cortez, for example, a priest of Zipitotec was rumored to have been granted the fire of the gods to protect his people. His efforts were successful until the Spanish soldiers came to his city. The priest warned his chief about the Spanish, whom he likened to goats for their unwashed smell and their pointy beards, but the chief did not hear his words. Eventually, the soldiers showed their true nature, however, and ransacked the town. When his chief was struck down by the Spaniards' bullets, the priest took up the corpse, intending to bring it back to life to protect the city against the Spanish goats. Something went wrong, though, and the body tore itself apart and the pieces fled into the wilderness. These chupacabra still haunt that area. Awakened on those rare occasions when one of the created comes near enough to stir them from dormancy. They hunger for pyros like any other Pandoran, but they actually suck the blood of goats out of that half-remembered ancient mandate to protect the Aztec peoples from the Spanish soldiers. Gremlins, the unflesh mockery pseudo-lineage. With a horrible, inorganic shrieking sound, the vessel rips itself apart, birthing gremlins, the Pandorans of the Unfleshed. The individual gremlins destroy the vessel as they escape from it. They immediately seek out high concentrations of technology, whether an industrial production floor, the nearest electronics store, or the interior systems of newer cars in a junkyard, and begin cannibalizing them, ripping away chunks of circuitry, hydraulic systems, and whatever else they need to complete their transformations. Gremlins are mechanical in nature, just as the unfleshed, but where the divine fire helps shape the unfleshed into more human-seeming forms, in preparation for the cultivation of Azoth and the seizure of Elpis, the divine fire shapes the gremlins into horrible, distinctly inhuman mechanical things, all oil glistening, black, rubber-coated wiring, sharp edges, and strange reflective pieces of glass and steel. Note that Prometheans are assumed to have the unpalatable aura merit with regards to gremlins, just as the unflesh have the unpalatable aura merit when it comes to normal Pandorans. Another note on Pandorans and the unfleshed. Though the unfleshed are mechanical beings, they are suffused with the precious pyros Pandorans hunger for. As a result, Pandorans gladly attack and eat any of the unflesh these horrors can manage to find. They do not care what vessel the pyros is found in, only whether or not they can get at it. When dealing with non-gremlin Pandorans, the unflesh are assumed to have the unpalatable aura merit. When presented with softer targets, Pandorans prefer to feed on those, rather than risk the strange taste of the unfleshed. Pandoran transmutations are strange things, warping the body away from the intended goal of the Azoth, the human form. As a result, learning these transformations can be quite detrimental to the unflesh seeking the new dawn. Still, mechanical manifestations of Pandoran transmutations are easily created by the unfleshed, ranging from generating additional limbs or internal mechanisms in place of organs to the wholesale transforming the shape. Though some of the body modifications that come with learning Pandoran transmutations are easily within the realm of possibility for a mechanical being, Learning and using such changes still causes degeneration for the unfleshed. Though there is nothing inherently evil about possessing claws or gaining a couple of extra limbs, it is inhuman. It has nothing to do with the unfleshed becoming more monstrous, and everything to do with becoming less human. Most unfleshed that learn these transmutations don't necessarily look like monsters, they simply look more like machines. Degeneration comes about as a result of the focus of Pyros toward turning, creating a form that is inhuman rather than human. Pyros exemplifies and evolves those things that it is used for, so when Pyros is forced to mimic inhuman traits, it comes at a cost to the humanity of the created. The alchemical work of refining the raw divine fire into the Azoth, hoping to eventually transform it into a soul, is reflected in the body. As the unfleshed becomes closer to human, its form takes on an increasingly human shape in nature as well, forcing the Pyros to transform the body in ways that deviate from what is possible in humanity causes the work of building a soul to falter slightly as well causing degeneration. Pandoran Transmutations Although these transmutations are available to any Promethean, few aside from the Centimani choose to use and develop them. If disquiet makes it difficult to live around humans, then most of these body-warping transmutations make it all but impossible. Prometheans who see others of their ilk in possession of these strange defilements of the form know to tread cautiously, for here is one 
who is a little too closely in touch with Flux. A Promethean who uses these tainted gifts risks his closeness to humanity. The first time a Promethean uses any Pandoran transmutation in a scene, he risks losing humanity. The wielder's player must roll three dice. Success on this roll indicates that he does not lose any humanity. Failing this roll indicates the loss of a dot of humanity and requires a roll for a derangement as usual. If the Promethean develops one of the permanent Pandoran transmutations, he does not need to have to resist humanity loss every time he uses it. Instead, when the transmutation is purchased, he automatically loses a dot of humanity while still rolling to see if a derangement is gained from that loss. Prometheans who practice the Sentimani refinement do not risk degeneration in this fashion. Sentimani who have turned their backs on the pilgrimage note this with satisfaction, pointing out that perhaps it is actually the mad goals of the pilgrimage that bring insanity. Those Sentimani who are still part of the pilgrimage suggest that perhaps it is because in embracing the monster they are that they may find and keep their true humanity. But we'll just save this for my favorite refinement later. Most of these transformations are self-explained, just by their title alone. To save on time, I'm just going to list them and let your mind wander for right now. Just as a disclaimer, these are all from 1E, not 2E. 2E really removed the teeth of Pandorans comparatively, and reduced these to a set of dread powers. Now, you can use the dread powers, however, unless you know where they came from, these 1E transformations, the book doesn't really manage it well. Much like my hybridization earlier, it also applies here. I decided to make this section focus more on 1E that could be translated into 2E with dread powers, with both sets listed. The goal of this section is to show you where these 2E powers actually came from, because that's very important. 1 Dot Pandoran Transmutations Armor, 1 to 5 dots. Bizarre weaponry, 1 to 5 dots. Including body barbs, bone spurs, breath weapon, claws, fangs, forked tail, horns, poison, and tusks. Man like structure. Scurry, 1 to 5 dots. Sebex gif. Small stature. 2 dot Pandoran transmutations. Balsam flesh. Beastly assimilation. Including armor, attack, special ability. Demon's Call, Flux Within Shade, including Corridors of Shadows, Shadowed Menace, Shadowboxing. Frog Tongue, Great Stature, Lethargist Body, Perfect Bezor, Two to Five Dots, including Acids and Other Solvents, Blunt Weapons, Disease, Fire, Poison, Sharp Weapons. Tar Flesh, Tentacles, Two to Five, Nani? Unwholesome Visitations, and from Pandora's book, Horde in Unity and Zeus's Benediction. Three Dot Pandoran Transmutations, Acid Phlegm, Serration of Form, Clockwork Servant, Detached Limb, including Arm, Entrails, Hand, Head, and Leg, Fever Dreams, Hundred Hands, including Arm, Brain, Ear, Eye, Gallbladder, Heart, Leg, Liver, lungs, mouth, spleen, tentacle. Plague sebation, three to five dots. Wall walking, including normal surfaces, impossible surfaces. Wings, three to five dots. And from Pandora's book, Azothic Furnace, three to five. Flux attunement, Pandora's Lament. Four dot Pandoran transmutations. Crucible of flesh, inertia. Maliate, including hiding monstrousness, rarefied features, monstrous visage, healing, shrink, swallow, and from Pandora's book, manskin and visceral cording, including muscle augmentation, muscle hardening, entanglement, brachiation, attack, and other. Five dot Pandoran transmutations, mantle of lordship. Titanic form, Sanguine Victory, Vapor's form, and from Pandora's book, Unholy Repast. As for 2E Dread Powers, they are Armor, 1 to 5, Beastly Mutation, 1 to 5, Bizarre Weaponry, 1 to 5, Breath Attack, 1 to 5, Briarius's Prowess, 1 to 5, Camouflage, 1 to 5, Malleable Form, 1 to 5. Paralyze, 1 to 5. Scurry, 1 to 5. 
and wall walking, 1 to 5. Did most of 1E's powers make it into 2E? Yes, albeit it being a little shoehorned. It was simplified to reach a greater audience. However, having knowledge from 1E and the capabilities that a Pandoran can do greatly affect how you interpret them for 2E and what dread powers you select. That's why I included both of them. Sometimes, simplification can cause a little more problems and misunderstanding. Being completely truthful here, I entered Promethean the Created with 2nd edition. It wasn't until I went back and really read 1st edition where I realized where all the gaps in my knowledge were. Just something to consider and to take to heart. Conclusion So, here we are. I hope you all enjoyed this broadcast and I hope it did help enlighten you in what a Pandoran is and its evolutions. We didn't really get a chance to go into the different example Pandorans that occur throughout the entire game line. Some of my favorite are the Boston Pandorans, which are the Flesh Bats Under the Bridge and the Foo Dogs Chang and Eng. Take the time to actually look up on all these example Pandorans in order to better craft your own. It really helps out a lot. Other than that, I really hope you're enjoying this series. The approach of the series is actually a little backwards compared to the other ones we've done. I know when Chris came in, he did kind of the groundwork and setting the stage for it with the introductory guide. And then going in with Flux is actually the exact opposite of the other guides we do, where we take it from the antagonist's point of view. There are a few reasons why we're doing this, besides them being my absolute favorite with this game line. One of the common conundrums with Promethean is, I think it's really cool, but I have no idea how to implement it in my game. That's where I feel like this series is helping people kind of get their feet wet with it. If it's a game line you're interested in, however, you aren't really versed in the terminology and all the mechanics that go into it, it might be good to kind of have them on the outskirts for the time being and bringing them in as antagonists. Not necessarily Prometheans per se, but Pandorans and, you know, the Sentimani, which we'll talk about later, um, my favorite refinement. It allows you to get your feet wet with the source material. However, you're not fully committed to it. You don't need to know everything about it. And it's cool because you're exposing yourself to it, but it's a little bit more manageable than to dive headfirst into it. That's just my two cents on it. Personally, I think that Promethean is an awesome game. Going into it kind of cold, it's really hard to understand. And even in this broadcast, if you heard me saying it, I'm like, just kind of deal with it and we'll get back to it. We'll circle around. We'll make sure it makes sense later. That's how I feel like Promethean as a game, you kind of need to approach. But because of that, the barrier to entry is so high that a lot of people are like, yeah, I like this game. I think it's cool. But no one's played it. Anyway, it's just food for thought. And I'd like you all to comment on this. Do you like the way we're approaching this series? Is this something that you hope that we talk about next with Promethean? Again, it's a game that's really, really cool, but there's not much coverage of it. We want to change that. This has been Nick from the Botch Pit. Thank you.